<laughs> okay. All right, guys, we are broadcasting and recording now, and I'm going to kick the show off. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me today to discuss some of the cool news, I don't know if you call them cool, but interesting news stories of the week um, are Miss Valerie Jardin and Mr. Martin Bailey. Hey guys, how are you doing? Hi, Frederick. Morning, evening, Hi, Martin. afternoon. <laughs> okay, we got we to gotta start with you, Martin, because just so the folks know, we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon at 2.42 in the p.m. Pacific time, which is what time there, Martin? It's just coming up to 6.40 a.m., so... Oh, that's uh, not too bad. Oh, come it's on. not bad. It's not bad. I, yeah. uh, what time the, do you normally get up? Oh, about 7.30. Oh, um, okay. Unless, right. unless I'm out, you know, if I'm on a tour, I'm up at like 4, so this is not a big deal for me, really. Okay, good, good. I was thinking it was it was a little bit more... Now, you, you adjusted so that it wasn't in the middle of the night, which I appreciate. Yes, <laughs> yes of course, of course. Um, okay, well, welcome. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Yeah. Valerie, what's uh, what's what's going? Where are you? I always forget where you are. are you in Minnesota or someplace? Like <laughs> yes, that? I am in Minnesota uh, oh, right now. I <laughs> just right got back in... from uh, from Europe last week. Back so. from Europe last week. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Another workshop. No, this wasn't the workshop. No, this was a no. personal. We're going to talk about that because okay. you you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you want to ask. <laughs> you know what I want to ask you, um, but before we dive, because I know that's going to be a little bit. I want to dive into that a little bit. Uh, Martin, on your site, would you you made some changes to your to your Japan Wonderland tour, and yeah. uh, you have an Iceland tour coming up. I'm looking at the notes, and Sri yeah. Lanka in November. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I. Um, what is going on? Well, the the first thing I've spent a lot of time recently. Um, I'm feeling a little bit less like a photographer and more like a web designer at the moment. I've uh -huh. um, I've set up a, a credit card merchant account, so I can now take credit cards directly on my site when people book for tours. Mm -hmm. So I've just enabled that for my 2014 Snow Monkeys and Hokkaido tour. And, and we've just released the details of my 2014 Iceland tour. I'm going to be in Iceland in a couple of weeks for, the, for this year's tour. Yeah. But we decided to set up the... I've locked in on some really good dates for next year. So that's all set up now as well. Um, you can get to all of that from the... I'm bringing everything under one website as well. I mentioned on the, the last time I was on TWIP, I'm bringing everything under martinbailey.photography.com. So if you go to the workshop uh, link at the top of the website, that will take you to those as well. But uh, yeah, we've just I'm just doing the finishing touches. It's going to be very rushed, and it, it's it's going to be difficult perhaps to get enough people to make it work. But I've been working with a guy in Sri Lanka who's we've set up some amazing wildlife tours there. Um, you know, there's there's elephants, there's leopards, there's uh, a huge number of bird species and other things over there, and it, and they've got some great national parks. Yeah. And of course, now that the the civil war is over, it's been over a while now. Um, we you know, it's opening up again as a country, and, it, and it's going to be a, a very popular place to visit, I think. So, yeah, I've set that up. We're going to be over there in November, so it's just a few months away now. But yeah. we're, we're giving people a 20% discount for the first for the inaugural tour. Um, and th this is not going to be me running the tour. I'm, I'm going to be like the guest host, and it's, it's another company. So, you know, people are going to have to go to... Uh, I'll set up a short link at mbp.ac slash Sri Lanka for cool. people to go and take a look at uh, details of that. But it's going to be amazing. All right. All right. Well, cool. Definitely head over to Martin Bailey. It's martinbaileyphotography.com, right? Absolutely, yeah. Thank All you. All right. Valerie, <laughs> see, I feel like I'm the one that's this. I'm the odd man out here because you guys, I'm looking at your notes, and you've got Australia in February. <laughs> What's going on? Are you another workshop out there? And you're going to France again, right? Uh, yes, I have two workshops um, that are um, sold out in October, so I'm leaving in a few weeks again. Uh, one, two one-week workshops back to back, one in Par one in Normandy, and then the second one in Paris. Um, and then, um, then I'm, now I'm setting up the 2014 France and U.S. workshops, and they should go on the market by the end of August. Okay. But I've had um, Melbourne, Australia, scheduled for a while, and I haven't really talked about it but it's already half filled and that's in February. Wow. So is there's it still half time. Filled or is it yeah, half it's filled, or it's or half it filled half already. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a little over half filled. Okay. And, uh, so it's it's a go and uh, it's exciting because I haven't really talked about it. It seemed like such a long time away and now it's like okay it's not that far away anymore. So yeah. that's exciting. That's cool. Well, congratulations and I just got back. Thanks. 
just got back from five weeks. I was in Iceland actually for a few days, and then uh, and then France for a month. So, wow. but that was uh, family trip. Crisscrossing the globe, you guys, you're killing me here. All right. Well, I want to I want to give a quick shout out to our friends over at Kelby Media. They are. Um, I guess with a little bit of help from Adobe, they're giving all of the attendees of the upcoming Photoshop World next month in Las Vegas a full one-year membership to Creative Cloud. So the entire Creative Cloud suite, anybody that's going to Photoshop World, presumably you're interested in Photoshop if you're going to Photoshop World. Um, but if you go, you automatically get a $600 value Creative Cloud um, uh, membership, which is crazy. So nice. you can kick the tires of everything Adobe makes for a year. Have you ever? Have you guys ever heard anything like that before? That's that's I mean, a lot. That's a that's a nice that's, bonus. I think yeah. that's unprecedented. I don't think I don't think I've ever heard of a company doing that for an entire year that you get to, I mean, especially if you're doing like a subscription type thing. But anyway, yeah. Photoshop World runs next month, September uh, the fourth through the sixth. So definitely check that out. Just go over to Kelby site or Google it or something. You'll find it. It's all over the place. Also, yesterday I had the privilege of being a guest on one of our TWIP listener um, and uh, previous co-host, I think, Mr. Brian Fisher and Roxanne Kelly. I was on their Model Photography Showcase podcast, and they just started it. It's a brand new podcast. They're still working on it and filing it out, you know, off the rough edges and all that. But they are doing a really good job, and they're both excellent hosts of the show and uh, definitely check it out. I'm not sure when my my interview will go live. I think maybe in the next week or so. But uh, they've got a ton of, or maybe at least five or six good interviews up there already episodes. So they're off to a good start. Definitely check them out and support them. Uh, modelphotographyshowcase.com all right, guys, let's jump into... Oh, before I, before I leave that Model Photography Showcase thing, last night I had... Roxanne was on the show. She's a, she's a model and the co-host of the show, and she gave me a quote. She said, or it wasn't a quote, it was a joke. So I want to ask you guys. She said, why did the hipster burn his mouth on the pizza? And I know you know because you're looking at the answer that I put. <laughs> so the riddle is, why did the hipster burn his mouth on the pizza? And the answer is, because he ate it before it was cool. So that's the kind of <laughs> those are the kind of shenanigans they have on that show. <laughs> shenanigans. <laughs> yes, I use the word shenanigans. I'm not even that's cool. <laughs> All right, guys, let's jump into the first discussion. The first, so basically, we did this uh, survey. If you're on the TWIP mailing list, you got this survey that we sent out. Uh, I think it was last week. And so far, we've had over almost 900 responses in there from folks that are responding to us. You know, basically, there's a, que a questionnaire asking what you wanted us to change on TWIP, if anything. We were asking about the length. If you like the length, is it too long, too short? And if you haven't responded to that survey, you can still do so. Just go to thisweekinphoto.com, and you'll see a um, feedback link or one of the – actually, it's a blog post. So just head over there and fill that out. But some of the feedback that came back from that was you guys, audience, want to hear more about technique. You want more practical tips on photography and just general how do I do this kind of stuff tutelage. So we decided to focus this episode on that. And uh, so this, this, this particular segment we're calling How to Get the Shot. And uh, we're going to kick it off with Miss Valerie Jardin. I know I keep butchering your name, but I'm going to say it's it however I want to say it. <laughs> About street photography. So, Valerie, you are... Well, first of all, before we dive into your street photography, I want to talk about the fact that you went... I think you went to Iceland <laughs> with That's just excellent. that Fuji. <laughs> Is I that did. true? You yes, took, I you, did. That's all you shot with, with, was a Fuji X100S. I, that, yep, that's what I had, and um, and my um, I tried what really liked because I brought the Fuji X100S, and this was not a photography trip. This was a personal family trip. Mm -hmm. So you know, I wasn't on a workshop with Martin. I would have probably brought a bigger bag. But Martin <laughs> would not have allowed you to come. <laughs> oh, I would. <laughs> but you know, it was so awesome to be to be limited to just the one lens for five weeks. I can't even you tell you okay. how liberating. You didn't no. you didn't... Well, I can't tell you that the thought of my Mark, 
my 5D Mark II and all my L lenses didn't cross my mind a couple of times when I was experiencing the, experiencing the beautiful landscape mm -hmm. of Iceland. But crossed my mind. That's about it. I didn't regret anything. Um, I figured, you know what? I have a pretty fine piece of equipment with me. And um, the fact that it's uh, a fixed lens and I don't have any other option is not going to stop me from some making some pretty cool images and uh, I'm not a landscape photographer so I had no tripod I just had I looked like a tourist and that so was okay Martin, with me. Martin if you saddled Martin with a X100S and sent him out to shoot snow monkeys I don't think you would enjoy that Martin. <laughs> well yeah the snow monkeys you wouldn't be too bad you know because you're very Getting close to them yeah it's okay. it's more the, the stuff that's way off in the distance where you yeah. need the big glass. Right, right. Yeah. Right. But it was okay. I did a lot of street photography, even in Iceland. I spent more time in Reykjavik than I did uh, out in the country, because that's what I like. Um, but you know what? It was awesome. Paris for five days do shooting street was great, and the rest of the time I was on the coast, and uh, I had my camera with me all the time, and I think I did some of my best work. So, so let, I, let's talk about that. So let's talk about just you know just generally street photography and. When you're you're in Reykjavik, right, and you get up in the morning or the, even the night before, what do you do as you prepare for it? Do you pre-visualize, like, okay, today, this is a big town. Okay, so today I'm going to focus it's on... It's not. It's very small. I think you should pick Paris as an example. Okay, Reykjavik Paris is... then. Paris, <laughs> Paris. So, okay, today I'm going to pick shots by the water. Tomorrow I'm going to shoot old people, you know. Do you do that, and then when you, do you pre-vis, and then when you set that up, what's in your bag, you know, when you go out? Okay, um, unless I'm working on a theme, which happens, like last year I was working on a lover's theme when I was in Europe, so of course you kind of keep that in the back of your mind at all times and you're more in tune yeah. with that theme. But uh, usually I, I like to go out empty um, and just let the city surprise me. Um, so that's, that's what I do. Um, and I don't really prepare a bag. <laughs> I just uh, now you don't with that X100. You just you well, just grab even, it and go now, right? You know, even before I never brought an extra lens on any photo walk. So even when I was still shooting with a, uh, an SLR, I put a 50 or 40 lens on, and that was it. So uh, that didn't really change my approach. It's just a little more inconspicuous. So that's really good for street photography. I, I think now for sure I get away with shots that I probably wouldn't have got away with with a larger camera uh, okay. for street photography. Plus it's it's you can put it on super silent so that's really good too. Yeah. Um, nothing even flashes, none of the little uh, um, red light or green light or anything. Uh, so it's it, completely silent. Um, and it's not, you're not intimidating. Because I do candid street photography, but I also do street portraits. And trust me, when you, when you approach a stranger and ask to make a portrait, they're a lot more likely to be okay with it if you look like you're shooting with a point and shoot versus a pro looking camera. Mm. So I found that was a lot easier too. Um, so I go out, I bring a bag if I'm out for a long day and it could rain or if I want to bring a snack, but I, for street photography, you can't have your camera in the bag, leave your landscape at home, bring <laughs> with the Fuji, you need at least three spare batteries. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I just I just go. It doesn't take any preparation at all. Just right. to have comfortable shoes and you're good to go. Because I'll be out for ten hours. Wow, ten hours just shooting, <laughs> shooting, walking. Or with I heard that like you mentioned the battery life on that X100. I heard it's not that good. So you might say maybe six hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're actually of actual time out there. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty bad. But that's about the only negative. So. Yeah. Not too bad. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Awesome. Cool. So Martin, I want to I want to switch gears and, and chat with you a little bit about landscape, and we can cross pollinate here as well, street photography landscape. Um, but with with the landscape stuff that you're doing, when you take us like like take us in the time machine back on a Martin Bailey shoot, when you're or even take it on one of your workshops, for example, when you have to be prepared to answer questions and you got to be on, and there's no margin for error for the instructor saying. 
Um, you know what, guys? My camera's dead. <laughs> Does anybody have an extra? So what do you do? Like, how do you prepare the night before um, and then the day of? What are you out on a landscape shoot with? Well, I, I generally work with two bodies anyway because, especially with my tours, I, you know, obviously there's no room for, for having a, a, a camera body break. Um, it's never happened to me, but I, I also carry two bodies because sometimes I'm, I'm mixing wildlife photography with landscape. And when you're doing wildlife, you often have to switch between lenses so fast that you need two bodies so that it's just a case of reaching for a different body. Yeah. Um, but but if I'm just w walking out for for landscape alone and I know that that's all I'm going to do, I'll generally have one body. I'll usually go for the higher resolution unless it's going to be bad weather. Um, if it's if it's a possibility that I'm going to be out in the rain, which I love. I mean, I, I'm not a a fair weather photographer, but if it's going to be rainy, then I'll probably go for the 1DX over the 5D because it's it's weatherproof. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, I've, I'm actually just. Uh, written a uh, an article for one of the future uh, issues of of Craft and Vision's photograph mag magazine about ma it's called Make Yourself Comfortable, mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know especially with outdoor photography, uh, you it's important to make sure that you're dressed for the occasion. You know if you if you if you get too hot or too cold, it can get you back in the car and home before you know it. Yeah. So you know I mean a big thing apart from the gear is actually what you wear, making sure that you're you're able to handle the conditions that you're going to be photographing in. You know, one when when other thing that I would add on that is, it, and it goes, it goes to being comfortable, and that's food. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That can end, and, you know, go use the restroom before you leave. But being hungry can yeah. ruin a shoot or, or make you rush or even shaky, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Have, you, have you found that? Do you throw, like, like uh, candy bars or whatever in your bag when you go out, Mark? Well, I I don't I usually if I'm if I'm going to be out for just say a day here in Japan somewhere not so much a workshop because work with workshops I've always got the next meal set up ready we're just going to go somewhere and we're going to shoot for a while um, but even then I guess for dawn shoots if before breakfast I will still have a cereal bar or something like that in my in my bag. And I'm, I might nibble on something if I start to feel hungry before breakfast. I've got plenty put away, though. I mean, I, <laughs> it's, I, I, uh, I just you're not a camel, on, though, Mark. <laughs> well, no, but I, I just start to suck on some of my reserves if I. Uh, <laughs> but, but I, uh, I, you know, I, I do generally carry. Uh, I like those little, uh, like weeder jelly things that you you can just have one in your in your vest pocket. Uh, and then you know if you, if it gets to lunchtime and you don't want to t spend the time to go and get lunch, then sometimes I'll just I'll just you know eat one of those and I always have a bit of drink with me or something, so I can get through one on a, a cereal bar or, or two or something like that, and that's just a way of keeping me shooting. But you know skipping a meal totally happens every so often. I just forget that I needed to eat. Um, well, especially when you run a workshop, it's so easy to just, you know, you think of everybody else and then you kind of forget about your own And you're own on that needs. adrenaline high too, right? Yeah. So that, that helps yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Valerie, do you, do you keep food in your bag when you when you go um, out on these 10-hour yeah. or 6-hour long photo <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in big cities, so, you know, I kind of sit at a cafe and keep shooting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. What am I thinking? Yeah, of course, you're not You're not roughing it. So you guys are like polar <laughs> opposites. Valerie's like, we yeah, I keep, I keep food in the cafe over there. That's <laughs> <laughs> and Why Martin's like, outside? yeah, I keep trail mix in my pocket. <laughs> I love it. That's great. So, uh, so okay. So let's go back to Martin on your side. Um, you're out there. You're capturing. When you're on site out there, do you do you find yourself backing up, or do you bring? Because you know those those little devices where you can stick your SD or CF card into it, and it will copy the images over. Do you mm -hmm. do anything like that, or do you just bring a lot of cards and and tackle it that way? I. I will. I have one of those with a one terabyte drive in it that I do use if there's no way at all that I can take a laptop with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I also make sure that I've got one of the biggest reasons why. I mean, obviously, I like to be able to process while I'm on the road as well. If I'm on a long trip, it generally I try to get a lot of processing done in the evenings before, so that when I get home, I don't have a truckload of images to get through. Yeah. Um, but if I can't take a, a laptop, then I will take the. I, I forget what they're called. They used to be called Color Space. I think they've changed now. But the ones, they're great. They're really fast. They, their batteries 
will uh, allow you to download three or four cards before you, they need to be recharged. Mm. But also, if you plug in an external hard drive to those, you can run a command that makes it back up everything that it has, either totally or incrementally, to an external hard drive. Mm. And that means you don't have to trust your images on one hard drive. And that's the important thing. If, if you use any sort of portable um, storage, you just have to make sure. The, the old Epsons do it as well, the P7000, things like that. If you just plug in a, a second external hard drive, USB, then they will uh, they have a command that they'll back up all of the, the images that you've got on that storage into the second hard drive. The, so, device that you, the, the one that you have, does it have a, a display on it? And, it does, or is it yeah. just blind? It's It's got a display on it. So... Okay. Yeah, the the color space one, of the the old one that well, the, it's it's newer than the the Epsons that I bought. Um, but they you can buy just a shell, and then you buy a an off the shelf two and a half inch hard drive and stick that in there. Um, so you can you can really get. I mean, nowadays I'm not sure if they support it, but there are there are larger hard drives, so you can put those in. But um, yeah, they they have a little screen on. And if you're shooting raw, they, they take a little bit of time to look at the images. So you, it's not as though you're, you're really using them to view the images. That's just a, a, a backup, a, a mental sort of check. You know, just so make you can sure see that, that there's, yeah. there's something there. Otherwise, right. you'd be waiting for a flashing light to finish flashing. And then right, <laughs> right. And the Epsons, on the other hand, I mean, they, they were called portable storage and media viewers, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it even says it on the front of them because they had a reasonably big screen. Uh, but you know, I mean, these days, honestly, I'm I'm normally away from home for more than a few days, and I just have my laptop with me. Yeah. Uh, but again, that means that when I get back to the hotel, I use big, I use like 64 gigabyte and 120 gigabyte cards because I I often like to flip into video as well. Mm -hmm. And if you if you start to do more than a few minutes of video, that's that that's quite a lot of memory. So Yep. Yeah, they. I I like to use big cards. I generally don't have to reformat them for a few days if and if I you know if I don't have time to back them up. But I normally the process is I get back to the hotel, I transfer the images to my hard drive on my laptop, and then I put that second hard the second external hard drive in and back everything up to that as well. And then usually while I'm sleeping, I'll I'll stick in a portable time machine backup. And just let it. Then everything that's on the on the local hard drive will also get backed up. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and I actually do a second backup of the back of the backup. So you know, I, I always. <laughs> I'm hearing I'm hearing layers and layers of yeah. complexity and backup here, and I'm gonna guess Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna guess that your backup strategy isn't quite as bulletproof as Mark's. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, no, I'm actually good at backing up, but I don't shoot as much. I mean, this is street photography. You get one shot. It's not like you're doing landscape where you're gonna, you know, go yeah. back and keep trying. And so, you know, on any given day, I could shoot 50 to 100 frames. You know, so for me, I back up pretty quick. I I have my MacBook Air, two pounds. Yes. Just the 11 inch, which I just bought like the day before I left on my last trip. I was traveling light between the two. I don't think I had four pounds of equipment. That's great. Uh, Isn't that crazy? And, that is just you know, crazy. You know, 50 to 100 frames for me is a travel day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like, that's like I'm heading out there. Oh, look! Look what's out the window, and the, and the, oh, the <laughs> yeah. airport's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's uh, so I I do back up every night, and I don't format my CF or SD cards until I'm home from my trip. So I back up on the on on my hard drive, then on a portable drive, and right. then I keep my my cards in a separate location. Usually, they stay in my with me. That's good. Have you has, have either of you ever had a situation where you lost a day of images because you didn't back up or something failed or something got stolen or something like that? No. Nope. No. I, mm -hmm. th that actually leads reminds me of a good tip though. Do grab some of the. You often have to pay a yearly fee for it these days, but SanDisk and Lexar they they have uh, the the card restore or image restore software. Um, I think Sandis is called um, Photo Restore Pro or Premium or something like that. Yeah. But I mean, as the workshop leader, I've saved people's cards. I always make sure that I've got a working copy of that kind of software on my machine. 
Yeah. Yeah. What one guy when I was in in Antarctica the first time a couple of years ago, um, he said, I've, I've, I forgot that I'd not downloaded and formatted my card. Can you do anything? And I'm like, yeah, don't touch the card. Just bring it to me. And I, I rescued all of his images from the card. Uh, you know, as because the, I mean, I think it was actually Valerie that was on here before when I mentioned this that when you format a card, all you're doing it's like the book is of all of the pages are still there. All you're doing is ripping out the page, the, the table of contents. Mm -hmm. And if you go back in and and search for it with software, the images are there. It just it's just that you need to rebuild the table of contents to tell the yep. the software where they are. So you can you can do that with the software that you that. I always carry with me. It's SanDisk, Lexar, make it. I'm sure there are third-party companies that do it as well, but they do a good job, and then they just dump them all somewhere else for you. And you normally have to rename them. They don't have the, the original names, but once you've done that, you can you're, you're up and away again. You have the data at least. Yeah. One one piggyback on that. I think we may have mentioned this on the show before too. Is the the that image restoration and recover recovery is one good reason why you can you know the, the of knowing how hard drives work but the other sort of nefarious thing is that you need to be cognizant of is if you sell a hard drive or sell a computer mm -hmm. or give it to someone and you think you formatted the drive in it like Martin said, you didn't. You probably just deleted the table of contents. Now they have all your tax records and everything else about you on that drive. Mm -hmm. So if you format it, Martin, if they really want to format it, what should they do? Um, I'm not sure if it's if you can do this natively in the operating system, but there's usually an option when you format to secure format or secure yes, delete. Yes, and, and that actually goes along and writes data over everything. Um, and that's that. Actually, again, we're, we're bouncing off each other here. But if you if you think you've lost images on a card, and you use it again, then the the new set of images will will replace the other ones. And that's how they securely um, delete a drive. You, they actually write like dirty data over the whole drive, and, and I don't mean like straight, strange photographs. <laughs> um, they they, uh, they they just write some sort of data in all of in all of the segments. So yeah, if you if you do mess a card up. Uh, don't don't think oh well that's gone I'll just I'll I'll cut my losses and continue. Set that card aside until you can get some of this software because using it will will mess it up. Yeah, that's that's a good good point. So one one thing that I wanted to chat about in this conversation about landscape and street photography is the I've been hearing from several photographers, and I don't know if it's a trend or a movement or what, but people it seems like people are starting to shoot more JPEG only. You know, and Valerie, I wanted to throw it to you first. Street photography seems like it'd be an ideal candidate for JPEG, right? Because you can go out and shoot all black and white if you want. Would you ever do anything like like that, or or, or are you just gonna shoot raw until the end and process at your desk? Well, I still shoot raw, although this camera has some pretty cool um, filters. And once you switch to a filter. You, ha you switch automatically to JPEG. So if I switch the camera to black and white or to square format or whatever, uh, then automatically I have to shoot JPEG. Um, so I'm I shoot raw just because I I treat I mean I I I've treat that the the images coming out of that camera just like I did from the SLR. So I bring them into Lightroom and then I I just uh, just a few sliders and I'm done and and uh, I like to have control of my black and white so I not that I you know there's nothing wrong with the black and white coming out of the camera but I kind of like to keep the same type of look and feel can't, so you you're with the camera that you have with the Fuji that you're talking about you can't you can't shoot raw plus JPEG and only apply the in-camera no. effects to the JPEG yes you could true okay. Okay. yeah but so then you that's could have a the lot. best of both worlds. That's yeah. true. And I may start doing that just to explore all those cool um, filters and, and um, options that are on there because it's, it's, it looks really fun. I just haven't had really the time to play around with it. But, yeah, then I will shoot RAW plus JPEG. Yeah, I wanted to, I'm going to play around with that because uh, I know some photographers that do a lot of composite or not some – they're not photographers, I guess, but more – digital artists that do a lot of Photoshop compositing and as they're doing the composite with the different elements in the scene they will they will put a black and white adjustment layer on the whole stack so that it removes color from it so they can more easily 
you know, get a feel for what the composition is going to be before introducing the layer of color into it, which is a whole different project of making everything look real, right? So, you know, I, as I, my brain automatically switches to photography, so I'm thinking, that would be interesting just to go out and shut off your ability to see color and focus yourself on the composition and that sort of thing and the exposure, of course, and then later, when you bring it into the computer, you can start introducing color as needed, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know. Martin, what about you? Are you, uh, would you ever consider shooting JPEG on one of your, when you're out shooting landscape or nature? Do you want the short or the long answer? <laughs> <laughs> Is the short answer two letters? <laughs> yes. Um, the, 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 Intermediately long reply is, uh, of of course, for me, no. Um, but a lot of people don't realize. They think that it's just about being able to change things later, but it's not. You're actually uh, condemning the quality of the image depending on what you shoot. Um, if you know A JPEG is always going to be compressed to a degree, and to, to not only are you, are you going to be saving it in 8-bit instead of 16-bit, so you've got less bits per, per pixel, let, less amount of data per pixel to actually save the image. You, um, what the camera does, and they're probably getting better, but my, my 5D Mark III a few years ago, I took it in for a sensor cleaning before I went on an important job. And luckily, before the job, I had a, a morning free. And I was out doing some, some personal work before that. And towards the end of the morning, I realized that they, they changed it into JPEG. And I'd been shooting JPEG and not RAW. Mm. And later on, when I looked at those images, I had some some shots of some mountains and and rice fields, and I I zoomed into 100% to check the detail, and there was no detail in the rice fields. Each mm. each grain of each blade of of rice was um, was all merged into the next, and so they'd actually taken the detail in the texture and mushed it all up. Um, it looked fine at a, at Full, you know, the full uh, screen, you know, normal viewing. But as soon as you look at it closely, you know, the detail isn't there. And so, I mean, it's not only a, a, a the ability to change things later. It's actually going to, depending on the scene, the amount of texture that you've got in there, you could actually destroy detail in the image as well. Are there for both of you guys? Are there any circumstances where it it, it would be advantageous to shoot JPEG only? In your opinion, Valerie, what do you think? I mean, without that raw um, safety net in there at all, or all that data, it, just shooting JPEG exclusively. Well, if I wanted to shoot more, <laughs> I mean, I was <laughs> actually you ran I tell out of my, space on it, your cards uh, because yeah. you didn't bring enough cards. So I you tell my <laughs> that, that's happened to some of my students actually. They're they run out of space, you know, by midday, and and I said, well, just you know, don't start deleting just switch to JPEG for the rest of the day if you you know unless you can buy a new card along the way but uh, that's about it yeah yeah so emergency situations only it sounds like Martin you agree yeah. with that I, if I had to if I was in an emergency situation I would literally go back and start deleting old images off would the you? card before I went to JPEG um, just because I know that if it, again, it depends what you're shooting. If there's not a lot of very fine detail in in the image and it's a it's a toss up, I I agree with with Valerie's advice, and I think maybe for street photography, yeah, it's, that'd be all right. it, uh, it 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 probably isn't going to be a make a big difference. Mm -hmm. But for me, when I've got texture in the shot, um, no matter what I, it's uh, there's often a lot of fine texture, and that's what I don't want to to mess up, and so I I would rather go back and start to delete some images. Uh, than, than go you know than actually switch to JPEG. All right, perfect. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and and street photography calls for a completely different standard. You know, I mean this. Um, it's like if you have to, you know, sometimes you have to compromise the the technical aspect of the image for the story, and the story will always win over the technical quality. Yeah. And sometimes it all comes together. But those are pretty rare instances, you know. So um, it's really all about the the story and not so much about the the pixels. Yeah, I, I think you, I've you got can... I've got three phrases here from you guys. So Valerie, I've got all about the story. I'm searching for the title for this episode. <laughs> I've got all about the story, and then two from Martin: dirty data and condemning quality. <laughs> I like the dirty data. <laughs> 
<laughs> you've, no, but you, I mean, what, what Valerie just said, though, is that obviously if, if it's a toss-up between getting a shot that's not technically, not technically perfect but, but still a great shot, or not get in the shot at all, then of, of course, I don't think mm -hmm. it, obviously it's not just street photography. I think that goes for any kind of photography. Yeah, that's true. But, it, yeah. but if you've got a choice, then then I, I would probably do what I said. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. All right, guys, before we continue with this week's listener Q&A segment, I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. This is me thanking Squarespace. <laughs> For the people that are watching this, we're not acting crazy. We are um, leaving <laughs> a spot crazy. for Suzanne in post-production to insert our sponsor read into the show. All right. Okay, guys, it is time for our listener Q&A segment. This is where you guys answer some questions that have been at the top of some of our listeners' minds. Um, we've got a question about a laptop recommendation. It's from Dave. He says, his girlfriend is in the market to buy a new laptop and wants to get one with a good display for working on photos. Currently, she has a Lenovo. Unfortunately, it has a display with a bluish cast, which makes it hard to accurately edit photos. She's not a power user, and she mostly uses her laptop for email, web, Facebook, Office, that kind of thing. And she likes to work on her photos using Paint Shop Pro. They still make Paint Shop Pro. Yeah, um, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I want to see some of her work. All right, so she, uh, or Dave wants to know, he wants a recommendation on a low to medium price laptop that will be good for that level of photographer. Valerie, what do you think? I know you've got teenage. You got a teenager, at least one teenager there, right? So. Uh, yeah, but they have expensive tastes, so <laughs> <laughs> I get their hand-me-downs. <laughs> That's awesome. They've got the power computers, and mom gets the uh, the leftovers. I, actually, my first MacBook Pro was actually uh, I bought it twice because I bought it for my son. Yeah. As a present, and then when he got something else, then I bought it back from him. So you, I actually you bought it, it twice. <laughs> you bought it back from because he's like, it Mom, twice. it's mine. You get <laughs> exactly you want it, you gotta buy it. <laughs> but I just I just bought the the eleven inch MacBook Air, which is Ooh. two pounds. That and, thing is crazy. And it yes, it is small, but you know what? I I favor comfort over size of screen because yeah. I was logging an older fifteen inch um, MacBook before and it's heavy and now I'm carrying this little camera it was ridiculous I'm like, okay yeah. I got the the MacBook Air and it's only for travel and um, and you feel I'm like you're cheating though don't you don't you feel like you're cheating when you can make those great images and you only have like three pounds of stuff with you <laughs> I know it's crazy but um, and then when I'm home I'm, I'm working on a 27 inch which was really strange after a month of of slow internet and the 11 inch uh, MacBook uh, Air, but yeah. uh, it was great. I have no regrets. I was so comfortable. So, so they, it's basically, a, it, it's so wonderful. in this question, in this question from Dave, in parentheses at the end of his question, he says, "Are there particular manufacturers known to have better displays besides Apple?" She's a PC user. <laughs> uh, see, I couldn't answer, but I'm sure there is, and. Um, Hey, does Sony already... have some cool stuff coming out? Like Martin, you know, you're not your your Mac as well, but do you know of any like if you were to one of your best friends comes up to you and says, "Hey Martin, I don't want to use a Mac. Um, what should I get? I'm I'm just starting out in photography. How would you counsel him?" I I would say um, you know for for the listener with the question as well. Um, Rather, the, the biggest thing is calibration rather than the quality of this. I mean, obviously, the quality of the screen matters, but a blue cast, that just screams color, color monkey yeah. display or, you know, if you, if you get a, they're, they're like $200 or 250 for a, uh, an i1 display pro or something like that, mm -hmm. you, you need to calibrate it. Um, but then, you know, if you want to go for a laptop that has, has a better screen, HP and Dell, uh, and some Asus models have have good screens, and if you if you really want to make sure that it's good for photography, just try to check the specs because if you if you can see a lot of them will say something like they they cover not the, the color gamut is 95% of Adobe RGB and things like that, and 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 that's what you want to look for. A lot of the higher end ones have have uh, Adobe 95% of Adobe RGB. Some of them only have sRGB. 
um, that it'll all work and, and it's, if you calibrate it you'll get rid of all of the blue tints and things like that. It's not a magic bullet. Some screens are so low, low grade that you can't calibrate them up to, a, you know, to, to get them in line with what the real world looks like. But, but Lenovo, Lenovo should be a pretty good brand, right? Yeah, I, I used to use a, a Lenovo in my old job um, before, I, you know, before I cut the cord. And it was fine, you know. It was it was not, and and people think that the the screens on on Apple's are are good quality. They are good quality, but they're not they're not the best quality. I mean, if I if I need to look at my images uh, and make some really really fine changes, I'll come up into my office and and I'll I'll stick the Azo on it. Azo monitors are the ones that that really show you what your images look like. Mm. And even though I can sit here with my Azo and my my MacBook Pro Retina screen. You know, obviously the Retina is beautiful. It's it's got great color reproduction, but I can see more more detail and more gradations in my Azo than I can on the MacBook. So you know, yeah. I mean, it, it's just if you really really was do, were doing color color correction or, or any sort of product or printing things like that, then you're going to want to try and get an, an external monitor. And HP do a do a great monitor. Um, NEC do great, great external monitors, but the the king of of that area is Azo. Uh, I, I was actually talking to a guy at a at a, a, a trade fair here in Japan, uh, one of the people from Azo, and they've they had a a new, uh, I think it was, it was a 4K, <clears throat> excuse me, a 4K display, and it was like I think it was like eleven thousand dollars. <laughs> so obviously yeah. they're not going to be putting that on the market for normal people yet. No. But but yeah. he was he was asking how much I would pay for a like a 27 inch or a 30 inch 4K monitor, uh, because the, especially you know the the new Mac um, Pro with the the little drum the cylinder right. is is going to support 4K two 4K monitors out of the box, and so that's going to start to change things. Um, and I was saying I would probably pay, I don't know, one and a half times what I would pay for a non-4K monitor of the same size. Um, so I think they're coming. I mean, they're not, they're not obviously going to listen just to me, but I think they're, they're trying to gauge the price of what they, what they will be able to charge. And I, I would pay a little bit more, but I mean, I'm, I'm kind of sidetracking here. Azo's yeah. the way to go if you want ultimate color reproduction. But if she, so for Dave's girlfriend, it sounds like what she, your suggestion she do is to calibrate that Lenovo that she already has before. Try that first. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, definitely. You're not gonna, you're not gonna lose anything because even, even if you go on and buy a new computer, you should really still calibrate the monitor once you've done that anyway. But if she's only a hobbyist, you know, it's not that big a yeah. deal. But yeah. it could be it could be the difference between buy set spending two hundred and fifty dollars for an i one pro display pro or something like that, and then be able to continue to use the the current machine or you know if if you still can't get it quite right, then you haven't lost anything because you still still want to you'd be wise to calibrate your new new machine as well yeah well yeah start start with the lowest common denominator first and then yeah. grow from there. All right, guys. Um, let's jump into the picks of the week segment. Um, this is the segment where our audience, the folks that are watching and listening to this, can uh, hear our co-hosts suggest something that they should go grab. And the only restrictions are that something needs to somehow be related to photography. Valerie, what um, is your pick of the week? It's a, a book again, uh, and it's uh, Zach Arias's. Uh, Zach Arias says. Book. <laughs> I don't know if you can say that. <laughs> Sounds funny. Uh, photography Q and A. Real questions, real answers, and everyone should read that book. It's uh, it's raw. It's funny. It's so honest, and um, we need more of that. And yes. I think he wrote the book. Um, that kind of stemmed from his Q and A blog, um, and it's um, it touches pretty much any aspect of photography, and. Um, I just love it. And actually, yeah. he was just interviewed uh, by Iberion X Perello on the Candid Frame. So mm -hmm. I urge people to listen to the interview of Zach Arias. Uh, he's, also, he's also a Fuji user. Yes, I know. He's And I, to I actually spoke to Zach uh, earlier this week. We had a, it wasn't an interview, it was just a, a, a phone conversation. And um, and by the way, I'm trying to get him to come on here. I want to interview yes. him and be a co-host and all that. So fingers crossed. Um, but uh, I told him he 
is one of the primary reasons for my exploration into the world of mirrorless is that video that he put on YouTube when he, I think the title that he put at the beginning of it was something like, the DSLR is dead or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, how can you not watch a video with Zagreus <laughs> with that at the beginning? So that started, that was among the beginning of my journey in, into the world of mirrorless. Well, but, it's the main reason why I actually bought the Fuji. Oh. After well, seeing yeah. his work and his, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, I was so... Um, Inspired by his book, that I started my own Q and A blog. So. Oh, very cool. Where's that at? Uh, it's just through my Squarespace blog. It's a new Q and A. I just started this week, so I'm gonna. Excellent. I just got a lot of answers, so I'm gonna try to answer maybe three questions a week or so. Very cool. Awesome. Congratulations yeah. on that. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks for that pick of the week. The photography Q and A, real questions, real answers at Peach Pit Press for around twenty bucks. On Amazon, or yeah, it's published by Peach Pit, but twenty bucks on Amazon. Go check it out. And Martin, what's your pick of the week? Yours are I, always I, you like technical. I like this. What is it? <laughs> well, you know what? I'd like to just say what she said because, <laughs> because um, uh, you know, I'm, I've just finished reading that as well, and it's just it's just amazing. So I I'm you know I have something else, but I can't I can't say enough about. Uh, about Zach and his his new book and his work and everything. Yeah, um, but he, I'm, he I'm is gonna... he is inspirational. I gotta tell you, absolutely. I mean, he uh, yeah. when I when I was speaking to him, you know, just like most most all you guys are the same way. You know, We're all, it seems like everyone that that we deal with on Twip um, and in in photography, when I speak to folks, are just normal, genuine people that like to share stuff and he seemed exactly like that. You know, just this normal guy, no BS, no yeah. pretension. Just you know, I am yeah. what I am. Yeah. You, I, I actually I met him in New York last year um, at the the Luminance uh, Photo Shelters Luminance uh, show, and he was he was just so down to earth. Um, yeah. He he we had lunch w one day. He he walked up and I'd already you know I'd, I'd spoken to him a few times, and he walked up and he's like, I'm, I'm going to have lunch with my little British Japanese friend, and, <laughs> and he was <laughs> he was uh, he, he was just so down to earth. Um, that's, he awesome. actually, he, he, that's what I'm going to call you from now on, by the way. <laughs> he, he actually, I'm kicking myself because he emailed me earlier this week, no, uh, last week, and saying I, I'm going to be in Tokyo at the end of the month. Can we can we meet up? I'm going to be in Iceland. Mm. I, I'm in Iceland from the 24th. It's the it's the first time I've thought, oh no. Uh, but you know, I mean, obviously, I, I'd rather be in Iceland, but it's a close call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, have him bounce through Iceland on his way to Tokyo. How about That'd that? That'd be nice. <laughs> So, so my my pick of the week. I'm actually I mentioned this a few months ago, um, but I'm going to come back to one an, an iPhone app called Photo Pills, and the reason I'm going to come back to, to on that is because the guys over at Photo Pills have sent me five codes uh, mm. to get to download. It's nine nine. It's nine dollars ninety nine. So you can save yourself a, a cent off ten dollars if uh, if you want one of these codes. It's a great app. It's basically for um, for staking out new locations. They, they, it's kind of like the photographer's ephemeris where it knows where the sun and the moon is going to be at, at any certain time. But it's all about planning a location shoot so that you get the, the best, the light at the best point in the sky. Um, you, know, you know exactly where the sun's going to be and your elevation and all of that. And yeah. it's got a whole bunch of other features that are just you know, great for the photographer. So it, it's, like, it's like an all-in-one ap uh, application in some ways as well. But I've got five codes, and um, I, th I figured, you know, I, I mentioned this first on Twip. So rather than sending them out to my own audience, I'll give them to the to five the first five people that email me from Twip. And that, what I'll do is I'll set up an email address, photo pills, just one word, photo pills at martinbaileyphotography.com, and the first five people that email me, um, I'll I'll send a code. And I'm emailing you now, Martin. So that's the first four <laughs> people to email. <laughs> so, Get it, so I um, and I'll sort that out for you, Frederick. Don't worry. Yeah, um, but I, uh, yeah. I, what I'll do is I'll also set up an auto responder. So once these five are gone, you'll just get an email saying, "Sorry, you know, they they've all gone." So I won't keep you in suspense. If if you email and you and you get an auto reply straight away, you'll know that you you were too late. But give it a try. I mean, it, it's 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 a great, a great idea. Plan. I like it. Yes, you're so organized. I'm so impressed. 
I'm taking notes. Setting up the separate email address with an autoresponder. Oh <laughs> I'm, I I'm taking never, notes. I would yeah. not have thought of that. Uh, no, I'm going to claim that I, t I thought of that. And <laughs> well, thank you, Martin. Uh, that's awesome. Perfect. That's a perfect tip. So my, my pick of the week is um, I'm going to go what we talked about at the top of the show, and that's uh, Photoshop World. I'm going to try my hardest to get out to Photoshop World, and if you see me, um, stop me and say hello because I may be giving away a couple of things from our friends and 500 picks. But, um, uh, yeah, my, my pick of the week is the fact that if you sign up for Photoshop World, you get a year of Creative Cloud. So yeah. definitely check that out if you if you were on the fence because then you can cancel it after that year and you've had a year to play with Photoshop. You can't, you can't really lose with that. So definitely check it out. So that's something they're giving to everyone? Everyone oh, that goes uh, to Photoshop World. Okay, even so, people who've signed up, like, signed up six months ago. Probably. Yeah, I would assume so. Wow, yeah. Yeah. that's impressive. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, like I said, that's unprecedented, and it's you know, I guess it's the kind of thing you can do when you're when you're selling bits, right? I mean, you couldn't do that if you were selling iPhones, but you, but yeah. it's uh, it's still there's a high dollar value associated with Adobe software, and it is industry standard for most of what creative folks do today. So if you're just getting into photography and you're you want to dive into Photoshop, you can get Photoshop for free and then get on YouTube and look for tutorials on how to use the thing or go to Kelby Training or whatever, you know, and get all this training and learn how to use it. Then after that year, if you say, you know what, it's not really for me, you can cancel it. You know, you don't have to worry about it. So I thought, it was, I thought that was really generous and cool of both Kelby, the Kelby crew and Adobe to put that out to the photographers. Okay. All right. Um, okay, at the end of the show, the end of the episode, I'll have an interview coming up in a couple seconds after the close with fashion photographer Lindsay Adler. So if you want to hear that interview, just stay tuned after the credits. We will uh, we'll roll that for you. But we're at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. Valerie, where would you like the listeners to go to keep up with you? Uh, just to my website, my Squarespace website, uh, and it's valeriejardinphotography.com, V-A-L-E-R-I-E-J-A-R-D-I-N, photography, all in one word. I have come to the realization that I am never going to pronounce your name the way it's intended to be pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> I've come to terms with that, Valerie. <laughs> so. All right, Martin, where would you like people to go to keep up with you? Uh, everything's at martinbaileyphotography.com. There we All are. Right. And, yep, Sorry. right down at the bottom there. Figure it out. And then once again, just Martin, I just want to remind people if they want to get that photo pills um, uh, application, you have codes, five codes for it, and they can email yep. you at photopills at martinbaileyphotography.com. First come, first serve. If you get an autoresponder message saying we're sold out, then Martin is sold out, and he has no more. <laughs> so, yeah, but and five, you got to get more than five, Martin. Come on, you can load yeah. that autoresponder with a few more. <laughs> <laughs> and and if people look, are worried, it's it's not me fishing for email addresses. If you get an autoresponder, then your email isn't isn't recorded or anything. It's it's just me trying to help a, a company that's got a great product. That's great. That's awesome. Although I was thinking that would be a great way to capture email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> Like brilliant. Give away codes. You don't have to do anything. It's perfect. <laughs> All right. Cool, man. All right. Uh, and listeners, if you want to keep up with everything in the This Week in Photo universe, you can check us out on thisweekinphoto.com, and you can join our community over on Google+. And if you're looking for me, you can find me at frederickvan.com or at mediabytes.com. And with that, it's time to take that lens cap off. All right, that's the end of the show. Folks that are watching us on The Hangout, thank you for sticking with us. I hope you enjoyed this. This episode will be on YouTube, on my YouTube channel in a couple of minutes, and um, it will be in the TWIP feed Friday. All right, thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>